So listen, I know it's not the time for this question, but this question has to be thought about, has to be addressed. Like when Vladimir Putin's gone, who's next? Who's next? Who do, who's next? Let's see what they think. Vladimir Putin has ruled over Russia for nearly two decades. But there's mounting speculation that he might have Parkinson's or some other neurological disorder. The debate about succession is more on a kind of biological time clock. Now the big question is, when Putin is gone, who will succeed him? I would expect that Putin will not nominate a leader to replace him until the last minute. We decoded Putin's inner circle and his opposition to figure out who could succeed him and what they would mean for Russia's future. That's a chess move. That, that's a chess move right there. I'm not going to tell y'all who I think should be my successor. Not until my very last minute, maybe even my last breath. I don't want y'all getting any ideas. I don't want, this is all strategic. See, everything to me feels like a chess move on the board. That's definitely one. Experts told us Sergei Shoigu is among the most extreme of Putin's men. <laughs> He's Russia's defense minister and one of the architects behind the war in Ukraine. Mm. Putin and him are almost always side by side. Shoigu represents the kind of deep Russia, the kind of romantic the Siberian tribes going on hunting trips with Shoigu. That kind of is part of the branding of, of Putin as a man of the people, a man who understands the breadth and depth of Russia. And Shoigu's used his time as the head of the emergency situations ministries to build his own brand. He traveled the country for two decades, announcing rescue efforts after natural disasters, telling people their government had everything under control. And Russians began to trust him. He was the second most popular politician after Putin. Over the years, Shoigu has had many wins, like leading Russia to victory in annexing Crimea and helping Bashar al-Assad remain in power. But time is not on Shoigu's side. Shoigu is himself 67, Putin is 69, so that's not a big difference. I would assume that Putin will want to hand over power to somebody who is going to be in power for a long time. He's going to want to go to the younger generation. Somebody like this man, Dmitry Kovalev, the 36-year-old head of Putin's presidential administration department. He was spotted having an intimate conversation with Putin at Russia's Victory Day parade. He's a new guy. He's not biased towards any particular member of the existing elite. And being new may just be his biggest asset. Putin was only 47 years old back in 1999. He was very charismatic. He was very quick on his feet in talking to journalists and talking to the public. That was an important part of his path to power. But now Putin is 69. It looks like two totally different people, don't it? That don't look like the Putin we've come to know today. That looks like a totally different person. I can't even tell you the amount of times where I've seen him be like just the demeanor in this little short few second video right here. I, I don't see too much of that. Nine years old. So the age factor may be more relevant than ever. Even Putin has said he'd want someone young to succeed him. Новое молодое поколение управленцев, ответственных людей, которые будут в состоянии взять на себя ответственность за Россию. This clip made the rounds online. People noted his hunched position, his firm grip on the table, his fidgeting hands and feet. He just looks generally uncomfortable. The Kremlin has repeatedly denied the claim that Putin is sick. Which brings us to 60-year-old Sergei Kirienko. 
He came to prominence already in the in the 1990s as a banker promoting economic reforms. Since 2016, Kirienko has been the first deputy chief of staff of the presidential executive office. More recently, Putin put him in charge of rebuilding territory Russia took from Ukraine. Знамя победы стало символом борьбы с фашизмом и с нацизмом. Putin surrounds himself with people who display loyalty. Kirienko is part of that team. But Kirienko proved that long before Russia invaded Ukraine. Kirienko was in charge of domestic politics, organizing the election campaigns. So that puts him in a powerful position. Dmitry Medvedev, who was handpicked to be president from 2008 to 2012, has historically been much less hostile towards the West. Unlike Putin, he was not a member of the Communist Party, so he is the first post-Soviet leader that Russia has seen. Welcome, my friend and partner. Medvedev met with then-President Obama and signed a treaty that aimed to curb the spread of nuclear weapons. But Putin only allowed him to serve one term. People saw Medvedev as just a shell, a puppet, Figure for Putin. Since then, Medvedev has been changing his tune. He's been very aggressively attacking the West and defending the war. He's even said that Russia is saving the Ukrainian people. Sergei Sobyanin has been much less vocal about the war. The mayor of Moscow. He messed up. And he messed up. And he's trying to go back and cover it up, fix it anyway, and get in Putin's good graces. But if if I could read Putin pretty well, and I don't think I really have a good, but somewhat of a, a decent grasp on the man, I think once you show your hand with him, you're pretty much done. You're pretty much, you can't go back and fix it and change it. Who you are who is pretty much who you are. And I think he's made it that long playing it that way. He's made it this far playing it that way, being this way. I don't think Putin's going to switch up how he handles things and how he views people and where he places them, you know, and what categories. So that him play, him playing his hand out like that, I don't think he'll ever go back. He can do all of that grandstanding he wants to. I don't think it changes anything. Over the last 12 years, he's proven to be another viable candidate. He's popular, he's well-known, and he's a competent manager. And three years after he took office, annual investment in Moscow had grown by 50%. Experts say Moscow's economy accounts for roughly 40% of Russia's GDP, which makes him a pretty powerful figure. So Byanin comes from the main oil producing region of Russia, the Tumen province, where he was governor from 2001 to 2005. But he's not young though. So presumably he also has good connections with the oil industry. And the war in Ukraine is giving Sobyanin a new opportunity to get involved. Putin has asked major Russian cities to help rebuild newly occupied territory in Ukraine. Moscow has been assigned to the Luhansk People's Republic. But rebuilding is dangerous. A car bomb killed a Russian deputy head on June 24th, and again on July 11th. That'll be a test of their loyalty to patriotism. That presumably would be one path into power. But even if Sobyanin doesn't double down in Ukraine, he could take over if Putin leaves without naming a successor. But there's also Alexei Navalny. That's the only way. That's the only way any of those last few people are getting it. If he goes and he doesn't name anyone. That's, that's the only way I can see them getting it. People even outside Russia already recognize his name. Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny. That's because he is Putin's biggest critic. Alexei Navalny is a lawyer and political activist who created a grassroots movement to attack corruption in Russian officialdom то мы оставляем за собой право еще раз обращаться напрямую к москвичам и призывать их в том числе к участию в акциях гражданского неповиновения. The now 46-year-old opposition leader was barred from running for president in 2018 because of a fraud conviction which many saw as political payback. 
during my campaign, I spent every fifth day in the jail. So now I'm kind of, you know, used to it. But experts say Navalny has still massively impacted Russian politics. He had his own YouTube channel where he posted very well-made videos exposing corruption of top officials in Russia, including President Putin himself. Tens of millions of Russians have watched his videos, so some of his ideas have seeped through into the mass of the population. But the Kremlin has repeatedly tried to silence him, most famously by allegedly poisoning him in August 2020, and he almost died. This is Alexei Navalny, some time after he was poisoned. Experts say it would be unlikely for Navalny to succeed Putin. The Putin regime has become very expert at shutting down the opposition. Vyacheslav Volodin went from being a Putin critic to a Putin supporter. He is the speaker of the Russian parliament and has gone so far as to say that without Putin, there is no Russia and he's made sure the Kremlin can pass any law it wants to. He started off as a regional politician from Saratov, part of the Volga region that accounts for about 40% of Russia's population. Presumably, Volodin has more of a sense of the diversity of Russia, of the poverty that's present in most of Russia still, and would hopefully try and orient the Russian economy more towards national development. And Trust or can control even from the other side. That's what that sounds like to me. I want somebody I can control, have my people control if they're still around and will carry out my plans. See, that's telling to me. These bottle caps were collected from the slopes of Mount Everest. And here at Sagan Martha Next, locals are turning this trash into art. But it's just a fraction of the estimated 50 metric tons of waste that litter the slopes of the world's tallest mountain. So what we have here is what happens to Mount Everest, over 110,000 pounds of waste. That's there. We followed the trash down from Everest's peak through its collection, sorting, and transformation to understand how locals are trying to control the Himalayas over 7.5 million dollar waste problem. <laughs> Local residents are acutely aware of the trash overwhelming their communities. Gosh. But before workers can recycle some of it, it must be collected from Everest's highest camps. Waste efforts are carefully organized by the Sagarmatha Pollution Control Committee, or SPCC, a Sherpa-led non-governmental organization. Climbing guides carry down waste from higher camps and combine it with trash at base camp. This includes plastic, food scraps, and human waste. Mm. As of 2023, 2,306 expedition groups had attempted or summited the mountain. And each group generates a lot of trash, an average of eight kilograms per person. At base camp, Suraj sorts the waste into burnable and non-burnable piles and bundles them for porters. The porters then carry the trash on their backs or via yaks down the mountain to designated collection sites. At landfills managed by the SPCC, Jeez. workers like Gilash Rai sort and pack the trash. You see this type of thing that never crosses your mind. You don't even think about it. But now that it's in front of your face, you're like, yeah, what does happen with all the trash? And then why is there so much trash? And then how does that affect everything? You start getting these questions now. <laughs> Ooh, 
बोतल और ऐसा बोतल आ चुकी है को अब यो बोतल रखिए ना यो चाहे बोतल हम इसी ने पील ने अन्य इस पर चाहे यो बॉडी हाँ जे some of the bags Kailash is packing are part of the Carry Me Back program, a crowdsourced waste transportation system. The program is managed by Sagarmatha Next, an organization seeking to demonstrate alternative ways to process all this waste. To remove it, that's a challenge because we don't have roads and tra transportation vehicles. So we made something we called Carry Me Back. It's a small bag, weighs up to one kilo, and we offer everyone who returns back from higher up, going back to the entry point, uh, Lukla, to take one bag, one kilo, and carry it one day down. Lukla is the site of Everest's airport and the gateway to the region. From here, the sorted waste is flown back to Kathmandu, where it's processed further at recycling centers. Sagarmatha Next first trialed Carry Me Back in 2019. During five weeks, we had 2,500 participants and they carried back 5,500 bags, so Jeez. around five tons in, in a test situation. And that was very, very kind of encouraging. In 2023, Carry Me Back scaled it up to eight metric tons. But the organization's efforts don't stop there. It also repurposes the trash it helps to collect. One way it does this is through its partnership with Moware. Moware sources recycled bottle caps collected from Everest and nearby mountains. Upcycling waste into souvenirs like these. The moulds are inspired by the topography of the Himalayas. Now that's pretty clever and smart right there. Profit, I'll figure out a way to profit off of it. Now, the human waste, I don't necessarily know or want to know <laughs> if they're any, doing anything with that. But this other stuff, yeah, figure out a way to make a profit. You know the people who are already work, working up there they're doing tours and stuff like that aren't really making any money. So let's figure out a way to get them some more profit. Sagar Martha Next's Experience Center also hosts an artist in residence program where artists like Joe Rankine repurpose discarded trash. The pieces that I've chosen come from a big waste pit that's below the Namche telepad. So I've taken my backpack down and collected all the pieces that I want to work with and I've brought them back up here to the lab. And now I'm working on a sculpture which I'm going to place onto this metal grid down here and this is a real challenge because the metal is so corroded so every time I've tried to make a hole it breaks a little bit. While Sagar Martha Next was established to alleviate the waste problem on Everest and in the Kumbu region, its founders bear no animosity toward the climbers responsible. Well I think we all has to try to understand as much as possible what it means to be up climbing on a mountain like Everest. Most people going up on that mountain are actually struggling pretty hard both to be safe and to be able to scale and go to the summit and then of course most importantly to be able to come back down safely. The nature of it in itself makes it almost impossible to have let's say 100% of all the waste uh, that is up there to be brought down. So uh, hopefully we also get that message out in the world that there are many efforts to try to alleviate the problems. The SPCC's waste management system is required for expedition agencies and locals alike, but it comes at a cost. It mandates fees based on the amount of waste generated by each expedition. SPCC le par ke jiko chahiye women base ko chahiye duise dasur be log nunchay hain base ke andar ki. Aur base ur ko main chhota chote un log nunchay rate ro. Just a polishing daga ur ko, sisa dabba ur ko, ani this pe si gallen navalle por ur ko chhota chote boise ur log nunchay. Climbers are also subject to fees and regulations imposed by... Or just, it frustrates me, man. 
to hear constantly on how they're lowballed as far as their pay goes with anything they're doing up there. At one of the most dangerous locations, workspaces, workplace environments that you can do, they are constantly lowballed. It, it makes no sense. For the Nepalese government, it requires climbers to pay a $4,000 deposit, which will only be returned if they bring down at least eight kilograms of trash, not including oxygen tanks or human waste. This regulation is meant to incentivize climbers to help clean the decades worth of trash on the highest parts of the mountain. The fine can be inconvenient for climbers and their guides, like Furba Wangchu Shirpa, who struggle to meet the requirement. While oxygen cylinders don't count towards the eight kilograms of waste required per climber, they're too expensive to leave behind. Each cylinder costs $600, and that price has incentivized climbers to return them instead of leaving them on the mountain. This is the first time that we have to do this. The first time that we have to do this, we have to do this. 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 We to do this. We have 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 to do this. Even what? more reasons he should make more money. You see how many cylinders he had on his back just then? And, and any convenience is left up to the Sherpas. And it, it, it's continuing to be frustrating for me to see this. Your cylinder is in Himal Machurnagalagi. It's a cost, they are very expensive. So, suppose the surprise of the cylinder is in the Tolly Ounce. In 2019, the Nepalese government enlisted the National Army to assist in cleaning up Mount Everest and other heavily trafficked mountains. The annual program, the Mountain Cleanup Campaign, costs the government $7.5 million. In 2023, the army, in conjunction with Sherpa guides, collected about 36 metric tons of waste. Despite recent cleanup efforts, Everest's climate is still under threat. A 2022 study found that in about 25 years, Everest's highest glacier lost 2,000 years worth of ice. The receding ice revealed decades worth of trash, but also some of the hundreds of bodies on the mountain. Removing a single dead body can cost as much as $70,000. And even occasionally, the lives of the climbers tasked with recovering them. But the impact of pollution on Everest isn't limited to the mountain. About 2 billion people live around and downstream of the Himalayan mountains, in Nepal, China, India, and other regions in South and East Asia. A study of snow and stream water extracted from Everest in 2019 found concentrations of microplastics, predominantly polyester fibers, toxic heavy metals, pathogens, and PFAS, known as forever chemicals, have also been detected in Everest's snow and water. Concerns over the polluted water supply have led locals to consider changing their water sources.
and for those who earn a living from Everest tourism and mountaineering, alleviating the problem is an existential issue. Pachi lai, bagi pustal lai, lai naramre dia asa parsa kini lagi. Perdusan berda juga yo, he na ni. Pachi perdusan ni tap keram increase udah jang sa, he na. Jis pasi amro Himal ka hiu per hiu harupan naral lah. Jis pasi kalau pathar matra baki rancam ni, ya turis orang khasi awdeh nanti, he na. Sundar tapun garca, prakritik sorup ya thau terahnak lagi amle perdusan. What you gonna do then? Hmm? When the tourists start stop coming, what's gonna happen then? It's gonna make it harder, even harder on these guys who are already making low wage. So something needs to happen. Niyantran gan bolsa. Yo, basta ma problem ne yo. Ila management gan ne na man. Jai bolivia na yo hamro jo ila pure bisho ma chinni ko chai. Sab banda al ko himal bani ra. Bolivia na yo na chinni na bhi saksa. Tei bade ila chai ekdam management gan na ekdam atyaab siksa. 